So, good afternoon. We are taking one of the ship of the uncle of uh, Giselle Levy, and we are moving with a sh with a ship with a naviglio of your grandfather or your grand grandfather. We are moving from Tunisia and Tripoli, crossing the sea and going to the island of L'Isola delle Rose, the island of uh, Rodi, Rhodes, and also Kos and the other little uh, Camiloni, the, the, the very little island where, uh, come si dice, hanno fragato the ship Pencio and so on. In uh, only five words to introduce the the theme, Rhodes was conquered by Italy in, uh, from the Ottoman Empire in 1912, uh, 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 11, 12, and there were uh, something like 108 Ita proper old Italian Jews, and s according to my knowledge, but perhaps you are more informed, that something like 4,300 of local Jews. Inside them, there were some of Turks or other nationality. So this is our only to think about uh, us, about Rodi. Um, the first uh, paper is from Valerie, Valerie, Valerie McGeer. Uh, she is uh, Andrew Mellon Mediterranean Regional Research Fellow at the Council of American Overseas Research Center. She explained to me yesterday that is, it is a very important university and diplomatic place for do study and research. Uh, her current book project is a sociocultural study of Italy's forgotten rule uh, of the Dodecanese island and its, its imp impact in post-colonial post -colonial identities. We are, all the time we are speaking about identities and legacies in the Mediterranean. She's also a co-editor of a volume on the Holocaust and the Jewish communities of the island of Rhodes and Kos. And she has many other titles, but uh, I think this is enough. And I'm, we are glad to hear her presentation by Valerie McGeer. Okay, uh, thank you. I also very much want to thank um, Tamar and Haim and Amara for their wonderful organization of this um, very interesting workshop. Um, I haven't Usually when I present about the Dodecanese, people are unfamiliar with this history. So it's nice to be speaking with the crowd, which will uh, be able to offer me some important uh, feedback. And I, I welcome your suggestions and comments. Um, Seagirt and at the crossroads of numerous trade routes between Europe and Asia, the islands of Rhodes and coasts were home to a prosperous and often Okay, an often powerful Jewish community from antiquity until well into the 20th century. Today, in contrast, the remains of the Jewish community are but a memento mori of the Ottoman past in the islands, with the synagogue and old lip Jewish neighborhood littered by monuments that remember the community's deportation. Like all sites of the Holocaust in Europe, questions remain unanswered about how the horror of the deportations could occur. However, in the Dodecanese, these questions are heated by further ones about the degree of Italian involvement and collaboration. More recently, it's been documented that, the, documented that there were those who remained loyal to the Republic of Salo and that part of the fascist administration was intact after the 1943 armistice. And even more recently, that the fascist administration likely provided practical information to the Nazis that enabled them to deport the Jewish families in the islands. So census information, names and numbers of the, the Jewish community. These revelations have, have upset common communal narratives that the Jewish community nourishes about their history and their attachment to an Italian identity 
or Italianita, I think, captures the sense of what they're attached to even better than the word identity. Memories of Italian rule are often linked with the, to the idea of a renewed golden age for the Jewish community. Indeed, testament to the fondness and perhaps patronage of Italy can be found around the corner from the old synagogue where a monument stands in homage to the first governor of the islands for all that he did for the Jewish community. It says, al generale Giovanni Amelio la comunità ebraica riconoscente, 1913. The adoption of an official politics of anti-Semitism with the deployment of the racial laws in 1938 was a shock and a dramatic shift in the Italian administration's attitude toward the Jewish communities, and it produced immigration by the community, some of which was voluntary, but much of which was forced, as I will discuss. Although some inhabitants of the islands had seen the writing on the wall and were aware that European anti-Semitism could reach them, a vast majority of the community still continued to picture roads and coasts as insular oases for Jewry in the Mediterranean. The prevailing and unfortunately erroneous view was that any anti-Semitic attitudes that the Italian administration held would be mitigated not only by distance and isolation, but also by the Jewish community's important role as actors and instruments of cultural imperialism and whose sense of Italianità would be very important in spreading Italian language and culture into the Eastern Mediterranean or Levant. I'm interested in how the position of roads and coasts at the very margins of Europe presented a problematic frontier for Italian colonial policies. While documentation has shown to us, for example, that the colonial administration was extremely wary about mixed marriages between Italian settlers and the local population because it, would fe it feared that it would lead to the degeneration of the Italian racial stock. Its sovereignty in the region was so weak that it also felt it had no opportunity to interfere with this practice. It would be too dangerous. But what is remembered instead is the inability or the choice not to ban intermarriage, and so it continued, the fact that it continued with increasing frequency, a fact that has contributed to enduring legends of Italian, uh, Italians and their locals under Italian colonial op occupation is una faccia, una razza, one face, one race. As Nicola Labanca mentioned yesterday, the issue of memory in the Dodecanese is the subject of one very important study in which a scholar has demonstrated that the enduring myth of il buono italiano or italiani brava gente has as much to do in the islands with the local community's con contempt for Turkish domination as much as it has to do with the actual positive feelings towards the fascist regime. Yet what this study elides in its exclusive focus on the Greek community is the sensitive discussion of intercommunal relations and the way that Italy manipulated the Ottoman past in the islands during its rule. Given this context, I think there are several important research questions that emerge. Uh, one, how did the fascist administration configure the Jewish community in this li liminal space where the community could neither be considered Italian Jews nor assimilated Jews? That is to say, neither white nor black, but other or oriental. How do we square the perspective of the Italian administration as patron and advocate of the Jewish community with the recognition of its potential for collaboration with the Nazi occupation in the later part of its rule? How do we assign culpability and assess Italy's actions when still so little is known about the different actors that were involved in the colonial project and the relationship between authorities in, on the periphery and those in the center or in Rome? Instead of reconstructing tensions that were create geopolitical tensions that were created by Italy's empire and how these may have spurred on the alliance with Hitler and anti-Semitism, I suggest that we do well to investigate instead how colonial modernity in the Dodecanese managed a mandate over a population that it considered oriental or Ottomanized. These ambivalences can today be, can today be reconstructed by examining documents that offer us traces of the oscillations of identity and colonial no negotiations that coincided with an increasingly carceral path of local governance. 
The recent cataloging of a special surveillance archive that the administration kept with, and this statistic is impressive, 140,000 files for a total population in the ar ar whole archipelago of 120,000 inhabitants. Some of the documents which I will present here today has revealed a level of surveillance that likens Italian rule in the Dodecanese to the Stasi regime in East Germany. These documents not only testify to a potentially weak hold on the archipelago's inhabitants and the precarious nature of Italian rule, but they, ah, sorry, but they also provide vital information about the government's interaction with Jewish communities in the islands. Ho paura di non poter finire. Okay. By using these documents, it has become possible to reconstruct the different networks that held the Jewish community together in Rhodes, as well as its interactions with notable members of the community in Rome. To use the language of historians, to understand, I seek to understand how Italianization was not just a top-down project, but also a bottom-up one, and how parts of the community engaged with the project of Italian national expansion or empire. It is also possible to interrogate further how Italy integrated the population into an emerging system of colonial citizenships, layering this, while well, layering this on top of pre previous forms of subjecthood that had existed under the period of Ottoman rule or the capitulations, forms of diplomatic protection or small citizenship, as it was referred, piccola cittadinanza, that preceded its a formal Italian uh, rule. So I'm going to try and give a brief over here, overview of um, emphasizing some important points. It is important to underscore that Italy's involvement in the Aegean predated the emergence of a fascist regime. From 1912 to 1923, from the Italo-Turkish War to formal annexation, Italy brought its full diplomatic weight in order to introduce Italian language into the islands and to secure control over the Alliance Francaise system, which had been so instrumental for Jewish education in the Eastern Mediterranean in the 19th century. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs had to enlist the Vatican in order to force the one remaining French missionary in the island to consent to Italy's sacking of all the French teachers and replacement with Italian ones. In the early part of its rule, the administration also assessed a number of applications for positions within the administration from Jewish persons, some of whom were from native, who were natives of the islands, but just as many that hailed from Italy, in city, from cities such as Livorno, or from other parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. Many of these petitions were viewed favorably since the administration recognized the special competences of Jewish persons who tended to have a higher le level of education in comparison to the rest of the population, knew skills such as accounting, and were competent in four and sometimes five Mediterranean languages. The liberal era, in other words, seems to have set an important precedent for strategies of rule that were consolidated under the fascist regime. This unofficial practice of supporting the Jewish community in the islands became official doctrine in the aftermath of the, of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, but it was transformed into the new context of consolidating overseas expansion. A key feature of annexation of the islands to Italy was that the Dodecanese were exempted from the most significant part of the Lausanne Convention, which resolved Ottoman collapse by establishing the nation state of Turkey in its place. During the exchange of almost 1.5 million people in the Greek and Turkish minority populations, the Italian Dodecanese remain the last example in the Aegean region of Ottoman multi-ethnic and religious pluralism. Mussolini himself affirmed in a 1927 directive that the administration should adopt a liberal approach to naturalization to Italian nationality and be flexible on the two-year window within which persons chose to opt for either Greek, Turkish, or Italian nationality. And by choosing a nationality, you tacitly accepted to immigrate, it should be said. He added that such an attitude was especially the case with persons of Jewish extraction, given that neither Greece nor Turkey would contest the application of Italian identity, 
as long as, he added, they were of good moral and political conduct, and especially if they brought wealth and con connections with other parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. It is important to underline that this was not full Italian citizenship or, or on the other hand, Italian diplomatic protection, but a form of colonial citizenship that was modeled on the citizenship that had been created for non-Bedouin Libyans which was itself modeled on the French colonial citizenship law for the indigenous in Algeria. It is difficult to gauge how many persons were naturalized based on this criteria. However, we do know, thanks to the new material from the Carabinieri archive, that in 1938, at the deployment of the anti-Semitic racial laws, the administration attempted to expel 500 Jewish persons established to be non-natives. Italy's preservation of a continuing model of ethnic and religious pluralism after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire proved an ingenious aspect of its administration, as not only did it divide and conquer the islands while promoting ethnic minorities to undermine the strongest opponent to its rule, which was the Greek Orthodox community, but it filled the vacuum created by the sudden collapse by supplanting of the Ottoman Empire, by supplanting it with its own version of Levantine melting pot cosmopolitanism. It further added to this equation Italian mobility and the historic presence of Italians in the region, and the idea that the Italian language should once again become a lingua franca of the Eastern Mediterranean dovetailed with wider nationalist programs at home in Italy that focused on reclaiming Italian identity and Italy's central place in history. The idea that fascist Italy was, was able to support an exotic Levantine modernity became a central part of the urban redesign that commenced in 1926. Alongside preservation projects aimed at reclaiming the Hellenistic, Roman, and medieval past in the island of Rhodes were new architectural projects that framed and enclosed the Ottoman past. While the characteristic wooden Ottoman balconies were gutted in the core of the medieval city of Rhodes to enable a reconstruction of the medieval city to become a kind of centro storico, like one in Italy, they were left intact in the Jewish and Turk Turkish quarters of the city. And here you can see a picture of the Jewish quarter above, or rather, yeah, above. Um, the Juderita, the, the Juderia was designated as inside a monumental zone while Ottoman building practices were also referenced in new building projects that, under, that Italy undertook in the so-called new city or Neo Jorio uh, of Rhodes to draw and together to draw attention to the exotic quality of the local population. This accretion of different architectural elements and reference made Rhodes into a kind of hypertext of Italian empire. It was a modern day isolario um, which I'm referring to the Venetian practice of, of making maps of islands, modern-day isolario for tourists who visited the island, while hoping for an authentic encounter with the Orient that mirrored their expectations that came from colonial propaganda in advertising and film. Turks, and to a lesser extent Jews, were described and pictured as picturesque but ultimately backward and Levantine others. Yet complicating the binary that Italy set out to create between Italians and non-Italians was Italy's other commitment to use its prior history of expansion in the Eastern Mediterranean to new colonial advantage. From the Venetian Empire to the latter-day moment of the Eastern question, Italy had aggressively offered diplomatic protection to uh, Levantines or non-Muslim persons in the Ottoman Empire under, through the regime of the capitulations. I think we can agree that the term Levantine is to a certain extent ambiguous in its modern contra, uh, context. While the term Franco-Levantine, which is also used, I think clearly refers to uh, French-speaking Catholics in the Ottoman Empire, with the gradual disappearance of the Ottoman Millet system, the ter term Levantine began to encompass all those non-Islamic people of the inter Eastern Mediterranean who became untethered without the empire's unique structure. 
Given that Italy had frequently supplied diplomatic protection to Jewish persons, it therefore may come as no surprise that Italy's rising star under fascism had attracted many notable members of the Jewish community who were and intellectuals from other Mediterranean European cities. These included people such as Isaiah Son, Marcus Berger, Vitale Stromza, David, Davide Gaon, and Michele Abagli, all of whom eventually became involved in the project of creating a rabbinical college in Rhodes that was supposed not only to provide higher education to young men in the islands, but that ult its ultimate goal was to produce rabbis that might eventually service other Italian-speaking Jewish communities in the Eastern Mediterranean. Vitale Stromza is an interesting and exemplary case of the path of Jewish notables that found their way into and eventually away from the island of Rhodes. Stromza was a, a Jewish intellectual from Salonika who had been prominent, indeed at one point a candidate for local representation of his Jewish community in the very last multi-ethnic phase of, uh, of Salonika. Stromza uh, moved to Rhodes in 1921 as a personal friend of the Italian governor at the time, Felice Maisa, to begin a career of service in the Italian administration. He was one of the first persons to make use of a reform that Italy had enacted in 1933 to enable persons who, who observed Italian nationality without full political rights, what was known in official discourse as Italian Aegean citizenship, to naturalize to full Italian or metropolitan citizenship. So I have up here the documentation from the archive where you can see his successful application and declaration of full Italian citizenship. While in Rhodes, Stromza completed several short monographs about the history of the Jewish communities in the islands, collaborating with Isaiah Son. During his appointment as a representative of the community, he had frequently communicated with Davide Prato, the Grand Rabbi in Rome, about how to develop the international profile of the rabbinical college in Rhodes. Because Stromza acquired full citizenship in 1934, he was able to immigrate to the United States later in 1939, um, although he did so very reluctantly. And he wrote, um, we also have in the Carbonieri archive, there are uh, photographs of all of the letters that people exchanged, um, or many letters, the surveillance was so enormous, many letters between people uh, writing about the situation in the islands. And so um, when he realized that he w was going to have to leave uh, Rhodes, he wrote to Davide Prato in Rome with extreme uh, melancholy. He wrote, uh, inutile che venga a dirle qual è il nostro stato d'animo. Io mi preparo a andare a riposo, l'anima piena di amarezza. Abbandonare questa isola e tutto questo ambiente nel quale ho dovuto lavorare, uh, nel quale ho lavorato durante 18 anni con passione e amore. Yet Strumzo was fortunate in comparison with many of his colleagues who, given the fact that they were not born in the Dodecanese, were subject to expulsion uh, when the racial laws um, were <clears throat> enacted in 1938, effectively stripping their citizenship. Davide Gaon, for example, tried unsuccessfully to apply for full Italian citizenship in 1938 in order to find a, a way out of his expulsion. The Italian administration had for some time interpreted the Lausanne Convention's provision for the protection of refugees to mean that it was legally allowed to expel any person who was not part of the ethnic majority or what it quoted as, which was well known to be of Greek race and religion. This interpretation had already been used on Turkish subjects uh, for some time, and it was used again in 1938 against all Jewish persons who petitioned to have their sentence of expulsion reversed on the basis that they observed piccola cittadinanza or was still under the protection of the prior regime of diplomatic protection. 
The predominant understanding about the anti-Semitic racial laws in roads and coasts largely ascribes the choice of expulsion of the Jewish community to the extremely fascist and bombastic figure of Cesare da Vecchi. But it is also true that in the Dodecanese, an increasingly authoritarian and nativist policy can be traced back to at least the early 30s. The large-scale expulsions of Jewish persons who had naturalized after 1919 were presaged by a set of re nativist reforms that reacted to the increasing unrest and the interference of nationalisms that were nesting within the different communities. Kemalist Turkey, Zionism, and Greek nationalism all increasingly presented threatening vehicles of anti-fascist propaganda in the local administration's view. In 1936 and 1937, Italy had responded to increased contestation and protest to its role in the islands by closing all of the existing communal private schools, making the Italian state schools the only option for elementary education. All subjects were in turn, by governmental decree, to be taught in Italian, with mother tongues that included Ladino, Turkish, and Greek, effectively reduced to an elective, and then in 1938, banned entirely. This was, in fact, only a more radicalized version of what Mario Lago, the supposedly soft governor, recommended a few years before leaving his post in the Dodecanese. It was his view that accelerating the process of total Italianization of the population was the only solution to an incre a situation of increasing revolt and civil unrest in the islands that was giving Italy a bad reputation internationally. I think it's very important to keep in mind that Italy is extremely under extreme pressure on an international scale, that it's um, uh, especially after the invasion of Ethiopia, and there's wide uh, protests to its regime. Uh, so I'm here at my conclusion. Uh, persons such as Mosè Varon, this is he's the document on the left, illustrate how the deportations were the final solution in multiple attempts to deal with the refugee question in the Aegean. Varon had been born in Smyrna in 1922, just one year before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. He had naturalized to the Aegean in the 1930s. He had been a victim of the Leggi Razziali. He had made multiple attempts to escape to Palestine, one of which included a close shave with death by nearly drowning when he swam out to meet a ferry boat in the harbor of Rhodes. Therefore, not only can we show that Italy was witting of the 1944 deportations, and in red here, you can see the remarks in the red all mention this, uh, this is about it reports of, of looting of the uh, Jewish property and the, the Italians uh, write in red over it that they've been deported to the continent. But we can also retrace how fascist rule in the Aegean participated in shaping and in, in interpreting key ideas of self and other, native and non-native, and finally citizen and non-person. The stripping of citizenship of Jewish persons is widely recognized as one of the key mechanisms that enabled the Holocaust, as once Jews were reduced from citizen to bare life, to use Giorgio Angamben's distinction, they had no legitimacy, even as they uh, sought to escape European anti-Semitism. The view from the Aegean therefore illustrates, and I think this is really the subject of our conversation over this day, the view from the Aegean further finally illustrates how the Holocaust was also entangled with colonial processes and indeed can be retraced back to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, which by creating the first re major refugee uh, crisis in modern history par precipitated the problem of the stateless person. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm, I give a